Hi. So this project is going to be a fun one as we build a machine learning model that predicts if a Pokemon is legendary or not. Now Pokemon is very famous and even if you haven't seen it, then you at least must have heard about it. So let's see in proper detail what we will be doing in this project. So the aim of this project is to find if a Pokemon is legendary or not. Well, on a serious note, this project aims to showcase the importance of feature engineering and understanding of the data. Now, lots of people already know about, you know, Pokemon, the types of Pokemon and many more info about it. But yet again, before we move forward, it is very crucial to understand if the data you have been given and the way you have interpreted matches and the way you have built the model also generalizes on that data. So the details of the project. Now the project is divided into three parts where the first is building a machine learning model and the second is building a web application where we can mount our prediction model and the last is deploying that web application on Heroku. So we will be using a Django backend or a Django application to build our web application. Now the first part is building a machine learning model. So we start off building a machine learning model and train that model using the Pokemon dataset. Here before we build a model, we understand about the data and all methods that can be applied to pre-process that data. Now Django web app, basically building a Django project. So this is the second part of the course where we will be using our Django framework and where we will be mounting our model, you know, the prediction model into the Django project. Now the last part is deploying this Django application to Heroku and we will be using connections to GitHub while deploying the Django application on Heroku. So now let's start off with the first part of the course, which is building our model in the next video. So this is the first part of the course where we will be building our machine learning model. The first part of the code that is telling you from google.collab import drive. So this is basically trying to connect the drive storage to your Google Collab so that Google Collab can access the drive. Next, as you can see, I have imported the necessary libraries which will help in data handling and data manipulation. Some of you might not know, but Seaborn is a library that complements or supports the matplotlib library since both of them work well when we need to visualize the data. Now the next thing you can see is that I have called random forest classifier that is our model and to judge its accuracy I'm using some metrics like accuracy score and classification report. Next you can see I'm calling random forest classifier and just to make one thing clear about random forest classifier is that this classifier overfits very easily on the data. So while we are training and testing, if we get a very high training accuracy, but a very low training, uh, sorry, testing accuracy, that means that the model has overfit on the data. Well, I've also provided the link to the data set as a backup in case you want to know where this data set came from or if you want to understand more about the data set. Now the first thing I'm doing is calling out the data set and storing it in a variable named Pokemon data. Now you can see that I'm using the head function of my data frame to see the first five values in my data set. And as you can see, it has a lot of columns and a lot of them are categorical columns, which I will talk about later. But from the info, you must have understood 
that which column is our target variable as i have talked about in the intro also that our main purpose is to understand and predict which pokemon is legendary so from the data set you can see that is legendary column will be our target variable now moving on from this point on we start with our exploratory data analysis and handling of null values so first thing you can see is i'm using a is null function and a sum function this is basically telling me the sum of the number of time null value has occurred in each column and as you can see it is giving me 371 77 530 for the particular columns and the rest are zero now use the shape function which is telling me the cardan cardinality of my data set so it, it is telling me that there are 721 rows and 23 columns so from the shape it is clear that the data set is small and we can remove the null value columns so why i am directly removing and not filling the null value columns is because if i fill values that have 530 null value it is meaning that more than half values i am filling and it makes the data set a little biased which is not favorable so as i had mentioned before type 2 egg group 2 and pr male have null values and you can see that here yeah here you can see i am removing those two columns but i have specified three so what i am doing with the third column you can see that for pr male it had only 77 missing values so 77 missing values is like 10% of my data so i am not directly removing that column i am filling there so if there is too much of filling to be done i am removing it directly if there is less filling to be done then i am filling it so what am i filling it with you can see here i use the value counts function and from there i am able to understand that for pr male column i have this type of data and how many times they have occurred so you can see that 0.5 is the mode for this column so i am filling it with the mode value itself next i use the tail function which is like the head function but differs when it prints the last five value in my data set and not the first so this is the describe function that i have used now the describe is used to view some basic statistical details like percentile mean standard deviation etc so it basically summarizes for you all the integral data that you have in your data set you can infer a lot from it and one thing that i would like to point out is to look for max min ranges you can see that a minimum is supported here and a max is supported here so you can see the range for this number column is 720 or basically 721 to 1 similarly for total for hp and all of the integral columns now why i am actually asking you to emphasize here is because if all the columns have similar ranges then it's good but if it doesn't have similar ranges then you have to standardize your data or normalize some of the columns now standardizing the data is basically asking you to make a range in which all of the columns having all of their different values can fit in and normalizing is basically changing your range that is changing your max and min value so there are different ways you can handle normalizing and start, uh, sorry and standardizing and a lot of different approaches have been made and are used in different situations so for example 
let me just give you a simple example of how you can you know normalize your data let's say the range for one column was from 20 to 20000 now what you can do is use a let's say max min range where you're taking your value x and you're subtracting it with min value of your column and say you're dividing it with max minus min. So let's say that there was a value x is equal to 300. So after stand, oh sorry, after normalizing, it changes to 300 minus 20 upon 19. 980. So it will turn to a very small value. So in this way, you can basically change your uh, column or normalize your column to bring the ranges near to your other columns. Now we move forward and look at the correlation graph. So the next thing, which is this, is actually a visualization of correlation graph and all the integral values. You can see that there is the integral column or value holding column number, total, HP, attack, special defense, speed, generation, since generation is holding values from one to six, and it has actually included this legendary also thinking that false and true are one and zero. And similarly other columns also. Now why has actually, you know, implemented this has a very important, uh, actually has a very important reason, which is to understand from all of my data set, which columns are actually useful to me or which columns are actually useful in training the model. Now you can see that this correlation actually has a value of one as its maximum and value of at minus one as its minimum. So it ranges from minus one to one. And you can see the values are 0 0.98 for a generation and number column. There's a value of minus 0 0.64 for columns has gender and is legendary. So you can see that is legendary is a lot more dependent, inversely different, uh, dependent in fact with has gender. So you understand from your data, uh, data set that you have some columns and how many of those columns are directly or inversely dependent on your uh, categorical column or say how many of your columns are actually giving you the same information? Meaning, let's say for two columns that are total and uh, attack. Now they are directly proportional, I would say, and have a correlation value of 0 0.7, which is very high. Meaning if two columns have a positive correlation, and a very high one at that since 0 0.7 is somewhat close to one. That means that total and my other which was attack columns are actually in one way giving me the same information. Now, actually this doesn't happen, but when the model starts to train and it takes in values from total and attack columns, so it thinks that yeah, nearly same things have been provided to me, which is for this data set, it's not a problem since the dim dimensionality of this data set is small, only 23. But there might happen that you have a data set having say 100 columns, maybe 200 columns. Then you would like to remove at least one of these columns since they are very similar in nature. Or the way they are affecting your target variable. 
So after that, we start off with handling our categorical columns or categorical data. Now categorical data like gems, they have a lot of hidden data in them. And if you're able to extract that data, your model would actually have a lot more predictive power as compared to before. So you can see that I have taken the type one uh, column and it has this many categories, which each occurring this many times. The next you can see that I have done the same for generation, looking how many categories are present and how many times each category has occurred. Same for color, a group one, body style. And now comes another feature engineering part. Now this is one way of handling categorical data and you would understand why I have used this or implemented this. Now I've used a function named replace, which is actually looking for these categories, water and ice and then replacing it with this category. So basically wherever replace function is looking at water or maybe having a value of ice in the column, it replaces it with water. Same I'm doing with grass bug. And uh, you can see that here, a lot of replacement has been done. So base now, you know, people who are really, really informative about Pokemon would say that, oh my God, what has he done? But this is important because after this, you know, handling of categorical data, I'm going to extract data, meaning I'm going to maybe build new columns using this data. And then you would understand that why I'm trying to crunch all of these uh, categories into a smaller range of categories. So now you can see that before we had, see a lot of categories. And now you can see that the number of categories has decreased, which was my motive. Now you can see that we have value counts function, which basically tells you how many times a category has occurred and all the unique categories specified. So I'm putting all of that data into a dictionary and I'm using my map function, which is basically taking that dictionary and looking out for the keys. So if in my body style has a value, which is present as key in my dictionary. So it will replace that key with the value itself. Now you might not have understood clearly what has happened. So later on, I will show you what this part of the code has done. Now see, my body style has quadruped and bipedal tailed and many more categories in it. But my body style new column has integer values in them. So I know that 135 times quadruped has occurred in my column as a category. So I've replaced the quadruped category with the number of times it has occurred, which is 135. Similarly for bipedal tailed and all the other categories. So this is the encoding part, basically using my categories and building new columns or new part of the data set. So you can see that now, yeah. So you can see that a lot of new columns, body style, new drag, a dark dragon, electric, fighting, fire, and a lot more with colors also have been present here. Meaning now all of this, was actually a category in one column which I've extracted and now you can see that there's a lot of zeros and then suddenly a one has occurred and then a lot of zeros. So this is telling me that this Pokemon was actually a grass type Pokemon. So whichever Pokemon, uh, whichever type of Pokemon it was, it would present you with one there and the rest would be as zero. Similarly for color. Here you can see that the color was actually green for this Pokemon. So one is present here and the rest are presented with zero. 
So next time I'm just looking at all of the columns, the data which had the columns already and the new ones that I've made. All of them are specified here. And then I'm starting to drop the columns that are not needed now. So you can see that we started with 23 and have come up with 38 columns now. Okay, so before we dropped, we had we actually had 43, and after dropping, we have 38. So finally, we come to the part where our mod uh, where our model is actually starting to get trained. So we are specifying our target variable, and after that, yeah, after that, we are using our train test split function which is telling that you yeah, have your data in the ratio of 8 is to 2, where 8 part would go into your training set and the 2 part would go to your testing set. Now I've called the random forest classifier and given a parameter of n estimators is equal to 500 and telling this class or maybe the object that yeah, you have to shuffle your data before you insert the data for you know, training the model. Now use the fit function to train and use the predict function to uh, do the predictions for my test data set. Now you can see that there's a 100% you know, accuracy for my training set and a 99.31% accuracy for my testing set. So you can see that both of my training and testing accuracies are very, very close meaning that my data hasn't actually overfit or underfit and it has generalized well on the data set. Finally, what we will do is just save this data set or the weights of, oh, sorry, save this weights of the model and use it directly to predict when we will be building our Django application. So you can see that I have saved the model to disk and this code here is to how I will load the model from my disk. So now we will go to the second part that is building a Django application. Now, this is the second part of the course where we will be building a web application using Django framework. Now, before we move forward, there are some steps to be followed, which you can see on the screen. And let's see those in detail. So the first thing that you have to do is 
just basically create a project directory it can be anywhere on your computer or laptop and after you have built the directory build an environment so if you're using a ide like myself so i'm using pycharm where you can just simply go to files in your settings and when setting opens up you can go to project interpreter now project interpreter is basically telling you that yeah there's a already built environment and that environment has all of these packages okay so if you haven't built one you can just click on here and there's an add button you can click on add so it's ask you to basically build a new environment here so once you have built an environment you can set all of the code that is you know my site having settings and all basically all of the django project inside your directory itself now go to the my site directory in your terminal like you can see that i have already built a project directory named src source and from there i am going to my my site directory so now in my site directory you can see there is a manage.py file so this is a very important file in django since most of the handling or creation of new app handling of settings maybe handling of databases creating new databases all of that has actually been implemented in manage.py this is basically the command line where you could say that once i run this command my django project will have major changes done in it so you can see there is also a requirement.txt file also so first we will be using this now if you have built an environment but it is empty so you now download or install all of your dependencies and packages for this project using the command here pip install dash r requirements.txt now once you have done this you can go back to your environment and see that all of the packages that i used while building this project have been installed there also in your environment so once the environment has been set up the code has been set up you run these commands python manage.py migrate and python manage.py run server so this command basically is telling you to start on or you should say create your databases that are required by this django project and once they have been created fill them with specific data that is required the second is python manage.py run server this is asking the you know django project to now run on a locally ser local server and render the pages so since i have already done my python manage.py migrate i would simply show you what happens when you run python manage.py run server so you once do this it takes a little time to load and now it's setting up a uh, setting up this django project locally and you can see that it's performing system checks and you can see that you have been given a url here once you click on it like i have yeah you can see that your page is rendered i don't have to go at the quality of this page since i have just basically used the html and you know forms in it but see that your page has been rendered now and you can fill up with anything yeah name of the pokemon siddhartha yeah, i can keep my name yeah cool 
but anyways you can now put data in here and all of once all of that data has been filled in you can just click on com, uh, confirm submission now you have been able to set up the project so let's understand the next thing which is making some changes in your settings.py and where actually the load or you should say rendering of the pages maybe handling of the data is done so this is the views.py file inside your app folder which is polls in my case you can see that here a lot of files are present views urls models and many more so basically you should focus on views and urls and models so first of all models is the python file where you are able to make custom uh, tables for your databases to store value next your url is basically the place you are telling that yeah and this url you are going to render this page so you can see that in urls you got yourself a path you are calling a function so these function are in views and you giving it a name so basically this line is telling me that on the path https okay http 127 basically local local host you are going to call this function and if we go into views my first function is as you can see rendering index.html so from here it is able to understand the app to render the index.html and you can see above that now i'm handling and preprocessing my data actually not preprocessing just simply processing the data that has come to me from my forms you can see that the index.html has forms in it and from here the data that was input is now going to views and you can see that there is a df meaning i have already created a data frame where i am going to store the data that i got from index.html and then you can see i am calling my pickled loaded model which is pokemon model so it has weights that were defined when we trained our random forest classifier and now you can see that i am using the predict function to predict if the pokemon is legendary or not from the data that i got from my forms so this is the part yeah before we end this second part of the course let me just give you a brief about what this finding type function is you can see that a lot of zeros and ones so you can see that i have in my first part used the categorical data to build new columns now first we just had a column where we were defining the type of the pokemon now i extracted it into different columns where i was putting zeros and ones so here what i am doing is if my type which is coming as x is dark then return an array this is actually a list so return a list where the first value is 1 and the rest are zero now if you go here you can see that for all the different types i am using this list to fill in the values using the zeros and ones so there is a difference between your finding type function you actually finding type function and your first function see the finding type is actually an helper function and this function is not rendering anything this is just taking in values and returning value 
but your first function which is taking uh, an argument sorry a parameter yeah actually an argument as request is actually rendering a page which is named index.html so there are two types of function here at work the first is actually rendering processing the data the second one is just processing the data so if you are able to understand what we are doing in view let's uh, let's just go and hop on to settings.py okay so this is the settings.py file and if you have just built a new project you would see that this is an empty list and you would see that there is a true here now understand this whenever you are working in development mode you can keep the debug as true but once you shift to production you have to keep that as false it is already given as security warning don't run with debug turned on in production or when you are deploying basically so since i've already deployed this code i've changed the code for false and have inserted my allowed host now you must be thinking where did this try one out dot heroku app dot com came from so once we are deploying to heroku there is a page specific page for an for our app where you could see this url So I have taken this from here, and I would specify this in the third part of the course also. The next thing to understand is setting up our URLs or static files. Now understand this that OS dot part dot join is basically joining two parts, and we have to in you know create this. and specify this in the settings file before production because heroku is not able to understand how and where to actually put all the static files in since this code is basically asking heroku that if there is any spe specific static files in my project then just make a static files directory and inside that put all of that static uh, you know thing so static files are basically css javascript images there are other type of static files also you can just you know look at the doc here and you would understand more about static files so once you have set up the settings also you are good to go for production which i will be covering in my third part now since i have already done this you can see it's already said that a heroku python build pack is using sorry as is actually being used the next thing you should do is click on this open app now this might take a little time and what i want to show you is that all of the files or you should say templates are going to be rendered using or clicking after this app so once you click on open app all of the files templates that are present in your project are going to be rendered so you can see that since the first template that i was rendering was index.html it has rendered but you can see one more thing this url so this is the url that i copied okay so this is the url that i copied and then set in my settings.py file you can see here these are the same thing so one thing that i actually wanted to show you is that you already have to build in you know repository where you will be storing all of your code that is to be used by the server in your heroku so you can see that my my site holds that was my app with the static files proc file manage.py requirement.txt and runtime are present here 
Now, once you are actually uploading the code, it might happen that there's no static files in your code. So if it is the case, then in your code, just write python manage.py collect static. If you run this code, then a new folder named collect static, uh, sorry, named static files will be built here and then you can upload the code to GitHub. Like you can see here. So you can make changes here after you have, you know, build a new app and use the open app button to go to that app. The next thing after you have, you know, made changes in your code and the final setup has been done, you go to deploy. Now deploy has three options, Heroku Git, GitHub and container registry. Now we will be using GitHub actually and you would be given an option of connect here. So once you click on it, it would ask you to, you know, log in with your credentials. And once you do that, it would tell you that, yeah, it is connected to your account. Like my account is set P278, it has been connected here. Then it would ask you for the repository that it has to connect with. And once you, you know, type in the name of the repository, it would show something like this. So my Pokemon legendary repository is connected with this app in my Heroku. Now you're going to skip the automatic deploys because for that you have to build a CI. And the next thing is manual deploy. So you basically click on the branch, uh, which branch you want to choose as your final code, which the server will use. So since mine is master, I will just take the input master and then click on deploy branch. Now this might take some time again because now the server has to be set up with the code and all the dependencies have to be installed on the server itself. So you can see Heroku Python build pack is being used and we specified our Python and version in our runtime.txt which it has now installed. Oh, sorry. Inst oh my god. <laughs> installed here. Okay. So next thing is it is installing all the dependencies from requirements and once it has done that it is using a command named collect static. So this command right here is now telling the server to build the new static files directory and all of the static files that are present in my code are to be put there now. And if there's no problem or error shown you would be seeing this URL present here. You can copy this URL or maybe you can wait for some time. And uh, okay, we will have to wait a little more. Okay, so once it has done all the work, has set up the server, you would see there's a deploy to Heroku and a tick mark with it. So you can click on view and again, your page will be loaded. See, the page is loaded. Now you can just, you know, input your data and all, and then again, confirm submission, and you would see the results. So with this, we end this course, where we were actually trying to predict if a Pokemon is legendary or not, and have built a web application for it, and lastly, have deployed it on Heroku. Thank you.